that you can scale later. So if you have three employees in your business, do you want to go to 30? Of course not. You're going to kill your payroll. You're going to crush your budget. You're going to, nobody's going to know what's going on. You have people running around like crazy. So you can't just grow to grow. You have to grow with a plan. So in order to put a plan in place, you have to think about how you want to do things. Because if you stay in growth mode, and I don't know if everybody's felt this way, but I've been in a position where I'm running a business and I'm in growth mode, I'm in growth mindset, I don't have a plan in place, I'm following sort of a plan, but not really. I'm just getting tired, you know? It can happen very quickly where years slip by and you've been doing the same thing for three years or two years or even 18 months and you're working long hours and the whole idea of getting into business, you're thinking, wow, I'll have this flexible schedule. Unfortunately, sometimes it's so flexible you can work 24 hours a day or it feels that way sometimes and you get exhausted. Well, if you're running your business and you get tired, I mean, not just physically tired, it's been a long day, 14 hours, whatever, but I'm like drained kind of tired then that means you're probably stuck in growth mode and you're not improving what you're doing inside your business. You're just repeating yourself over and over and over again. And that's when you get dragged down, you get sick, you get exhausted, you get sick of what you're doing. Everything just goes bad. So how do you get from this growth mode into the right mode of being able to scale? Because scale is where the fun happens. Scale is when you have a company that's growing whether you're there every day or not. It just continues to get bigger. It continues to improve. And improvement is more valuable than size. Getting better is imperative. If you get bigger in the same or worse, you're gonna have problems. They just haven't shown up yet. You have to continue to improve. So the first thing is to have a plan. Now, what is a plan? The first thing with a plan is, is it's written down. You have to have a written plan that you could hand to somebody, they can read it and say, okay, I understand. You have to have a written plan. Without that, you, are, you can't scale because you have to be the one involved in everything that's happening because you're the only one who fully understands it. You have to be able to write it down, somebody be able to read it, not you explain it. They have to be able to read it and go, I got it. And if your plan isn't like that, make smaller plans. Be very clear because that's how you create scale. Other people can do what you can do basically just as well because they have your plan. Where you are as the leader of whatever part of organization or organization is you're the one who comes up with the plan. But you have to be able, if you want genius, you have to let other people be able to take that plan and run with it. The other part of a plan is has to be measurable. You have to know if the plan is being followed properly. If you can't measure what happened, then how are you to know if the plan is being followed properly? And obviously it has to be actionable. You have to be able to have a plan that you can read and say, okay, this is exactly what I'm going to do. So it's simple, it's clear, it's written down, it's measurable, and it's actionable. Now you can do something with it. So what kind of plans would you have? Well, I can tell you, um, I started off in outside sales in 1990, January in Canada. And my initial plan was just trying to survive. It was cold, they didn't like it, unhappiness. Eventually I figured out how to keep my attitude, build a team and do all those kind of things. And I got into a point of management the following year. So what I developed was my first things first was my recruiting plan because I'm looking to hire and build and grow. So my recruiting plan was a long time ago, and in those days, we used to hire people through a newspaper. What a newspaper is, is the thing that's on paper, and it's got black ink on it, and you go to the store and buy it. I don't know if anybody ever does that anymore. So my recruiting plan was simple, but very effective, and I could teach it to anybody. What I did was, Wednesday, that's when I worked on my titles. Every Wednesday, I'd spend an hour to two hours just writing down titles. Because as we all know, a lot of what happens with your recruiting comes from what the people read the title and they like it. 
So I wanna make sure I come up with new titles every week, all the time, every Wednesday, one to two hours, titles. Thursday was the body of the ad. I would rewrite over and over and over for an hour, two hours, every Thursday, the different body of an ad, just to see different ways. Back in the newspaper, it was really expensive, and I was the number two advertiser in Atlanta um, from 1993 to about 1998. Uh, I spent about $125,000 a year in the newspaper. I mean, I'd go down to the newspaper, and they'd take me upstairs, and I gotta sit in the office, and that's where I place my ads, because there's only one company putting more money into unemployment, or unemployment ads in Atlanta than me. I got Christmas gifts from the newspaper. So you have very little space, it's really expensive. You got about three to five lines to work with. So rewriting it and figuring out how to make it so that somebody would pick up the phone. That's what I worked on, an hour or two hours every Thursday. And then Friday what I would do is place my ads. And I placed three ads every Friday. The first ad was my best ad from the previous week. Whatever ad performed the best, got me the most calls of quality, I replaced that ad, I, I reposted that ad. The next ad I wrote or, or placed was the best one from last year. A year ago at the same time. So if it's the second week in October, I go back to the second week in October, I pull up my numbers, that ad I'm gonna place again. Because same time of year it worked. It could be a spring thing, it could be a fall thing, it could be a summer thing, I don't know. But all I know is last October, second week of it worked, I'm gonna place it again. <coughs> and then the third ad I'm gonna place is the new one that I've created. I always have to be come up, coming up with something new that I can add to my stable of ads, whether titles, body, whatever, so that I'm always innovating and come up with something that's better than I've done previously. If I don't do this, then I'm gonna just have what I have. Well, imagine doing this for seven years. The stable of ads that you would have, the titles, the bodies, every detail, it's just an, it's a storehouse of information that becomes more and more valuable, especially in your recruiting business. So that was my recruiting plan. How would that relate to today? Well, I'd be tracking my numbers. I would be running whatever my best ads response from the last week or two, I would be rerunning. I would be coming up with new titles all the time. I would be rewriting the body of an ad all the time. I'd be researching keywords all the time. I'd be Googling things all the time. I would be doing a list of things over and over and over and adding to them and moving them around until I have this just killer outline of what a recruiting plan looks like. I would make sure I knew which job board to use because every city has a little bit different feel to it. Some are zip markets, some are career builder markets, some might be glass door, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna figure it out. And I'm gonna not only track the amount of people that come in, I'm also gonna track the quality. Where do my new hires come from? If I have four people who started last week and they came from one specific ad, I tell you I'm gonna rerun that ad and I'm gonna watch the numbers because it could have been a fluke, but it could be that that ad just has something to it. And I'm gonna break it down and figure out what that is and I'm gonna A, B test it and split test it until I find out what it is. It could be the title, it could be something in the body, it could be some keywords, whatever. And I'm gonna run the wheels off that until I know as much as I can. So that'd be my recruiting plan. So once you recruit people, then you have to onboard people. They come in, they start in your business, they fill out new hire paperwork, do all that kind of stuff. Well, this is when you're, you're setting the stage. You've already had the first impression with the person, but remember, they're getting to meet everybody for the first time, and it can be a little overwhelming. Say you have 12 people in your business, and you've got somebody who comes in, and they're not used to meeting 12 people at once. So maybe they get a little freaked out. Well, when people get scared, they have to come back from that. It's almost like you're walking through a field, and you look over, and you see what you believe it's a snake, and you get freaked out, and your heart starts palpitating, and you get a little nervous. You realize it's, it's just a garden hose but your mind doesn't realize that. You're still elevated, your heart's still flying. So if a person comes into your business and during the onboarding process, they get unnerved, they get uncomfortable, you have to now get them back from that just to get them back to point zero so you can make it a positive experience. And this is part of the way people are today. They want a positive experience, they just don't want a job. 
They want more of than that. So if you can give them a positive experience in the onboarding process, then you're going to have a better new hire. And that you just spent all this time, money, and energy trying to get them to come in your office in the first place. You might as well do the right thing. So again, it's got to be written down. It's got to be measurable. It's got to be actionable. It's got to be able to done be able to be done by you or someone else. Because it, again, it goes back to scale versus growth. If you have to be involved in everything because nothing's written down, then you can't have scale. You'll be stuck in growth mode. Even if you're in growth mode, always make sure you think in terms of scale. And I don't mean just because you have in a book someplace written down how to do this, that that's your plan. You should have one sheet of the plan that you can hand to anybody. They can read it and go, okay, I got it. Again, keeping it simple. So that's the, uh, the onboarding plan. And then you have a plan for new person development. So you got a person to the point where you're able to hire them. You brought them on, you got them set up, they kind of have an idea, an outline of what are the rules of the road, time you're supposed to be here, lunch, dinner, blah, 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 here's our hours, here's the expectations, here's when payday is, and so on and so forth. You got all the basics down. Now you gotta develop them. Because remember, if you are only giving a person a paycheck, then that's the only thing you're gonna get from them. You'll get as much as a paycheck delivers, and for as long as it delivers it which means if another company shows up with a different paycheck or less work for the same paycheck, that's when you have turnover. And remember, turnover is really expensive, not just in terms of cost, but also in morale. When a person leaves your company, you're the last person they're going to tell. They're gonna tell everybody else how much it sucks first and then tell you that they really appreciate the opportunity, their job and the J-O-B or whatever, and then they're gonna leave. And they go get another one. They might get a bunch more. I myself, by the time I started in business, have over 40 different jobs. I know why I left every job. I wasn't getting anything out of it more than a paycheck. And as soon as I wasn't getting anything more than a paycheck, I moved on to something else. So it's important that you're helping people develop. And everybody may want something a little bit different, but you gotta find out what that is. The only way I know to do that is make sure somebody's spending time with them. Now, should that be you? I believe so. Because when somebody gets started in my company, I want to get to know who they are. And more importantly, I want them to get to know me. Because they're going to learn whether they should rely on me or not. And I'm going to learn whether I should rely on them. So can you still do that with scale? Absolutely. Because over the course of time, again, you've got it written down as measurable, as actionable. Over the course of time, other people are going to watch what you do because you're going to in, uh, invite them into what you're doing. And they're going to figure out how to do it too. And then you can have two, three, four people doing the exact same type of meetings. It's really important that you don't hide what you do from the people you're trying to develop. They can't improve what they're doing and who they are if they're not involved in the process. All of this, of course, comes also down to knowing your numbers. It's critical to be able to track everything involved in what you're doing, whether it's how many people answer your ad, what kind of people answer your ad, how many people start from the ad? How many people are there two weeks later, three weeks later, five weeks later? Whatever your key indicators are, make sure you're tracking them on a consistent basis so you know where your breakdown is. I cannot tell you how many times I've worked with companies or business owners and they're trying to fix things that aren't broken. They're trying to, because emotionally they feel like that's where the problem is. So they're so focused on fixing this problem that doesn't exist, they're not fixing the actual problem because they're not looking at the numbers. And it's, I'm not suggesting for a second that all people are numbers or anything like that. But your system is number managed and you can find the problem based upon looking at the numbers because that way you can take care of the people properly. And you can't take care of them if you're fixing the wrong problems or fixing the problems that don't exist. It's critical to be able to track your numbers, your KPIs and all that other stuff. Last thing is innovate from strength. I mean, a lot of people, they want to do it differently than everybody else has ever done it before. They want to be the person, the man, the woman, the whatever, the, the legend. Well, the reality is this, success leaves clues, leaves crumbs. If you follow what other successful people do, you have a better chance of succeeding. If you look at Tiger Woods, you know, obviously in uh, the last 10 or 15 years, apart from a few spots, he's got a pretty decorated career. 
if you look at his golf swing or any other top golfers in the world, it's not so radically different that by looking at it, they're doing like he's swinging at it like Happy Gilmore or something. He has a golf swing. It's a really good golf swing, but it's a golf swing. It looks a lot like other golf swings, especially to, to golfers like myself. The rally is though, he's just doing a similar motion as everybody else. And that's what you need to do. Innovation is great, but it, you innovate from the top. You innovate from strength. If you are doing everything and it's going well, I mean, you got money in the bank, you're running a strong company, by all means innovate. If you're struggling to try to figure out what works, follow what other people have already done that works and do that. Too many people try to fix a problem with an idea that is untested. This is a mistake. Follow what other people have already shown to work and just copy it. That's the easiest thing to do. And make sure everything you do comes back to a plan. Now, a plan is a living document. It's not like you write down your plan, you leave it, you never touch it again. It's a living document that continues to improve and grow over time. So it's important that you're consistently updating it because you can't hand somebody that plan from a year ago when you've updated it 16 times and they don't have any of the updates and you expect them to just figure it out. It doesn't work that day, that way. Again, scale, scale is where you get true success. Scale is where you offer opportunities to people within your business. This is where everybody wins. Growth, everybody does not win. Scale is where everybody wins. That's why you have to get your business to scale. No matter what industry you're in, it does not matter. I don't care if it's a pizza place, I don't care if it's outside sales, I don't care if it's a call center, I don't care if it's a, a, a dance place. It doesn't matter what it is, as long as you put it in a position where it can scale. Otherwise, you're gonna get stuck. And when you get stuck, you're gonna get frustrated, you're gonna get tired, and you're gonna get burned out. Uh, from everybody over here at HR Stars, thanks for listening today. Have a kick-ass week, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you.